Good evening and a very warm welcome to you all for the final in a series of virtual public consultations hosted by the Ministry of Economic Growth and Job Creation on two critical policies, the update to the climate change policy framework and the emissions policy framework. I am Faye Ellington and I apologize for the late start. I'll be your moderator for this evening's consultation. But before we get on the way, I invite you all to stand for the national anthem. Thank you. You may be seated. If you're just joining us, welcome and thank you for logging on. We are coming to you via the Zoom platform from the studios of the Public Broadcasting Corporation of Jamaica. In studio with us is Senator the Honorable Matthew Samuda, Minister with our portfolio in the Ministry of Economic Growth and Job Creation, which is the ministry responsible for drafting the two policies we are discussing this evening the update to the climate change policy framework and the emissions policy framework. Also in studio is the Permanent Secretary of the Ministry of Economic Growth and Job Creation, Mrs. Audrey Sewell, CDJP. We are also happy to have with us two of the technical persons who worked on the policies. They are Ms. Gillian Guthrie, Acting Chief Technical Director in the Policy, Planning and Evaluation Division of the Ministry, and Ms. Nicole Origio, Acting Senior Director of the Environment and Risk Management Branch at the Ministry. Also with us are Mr. Ajani Alin, Research and Development Officer of the Climate Change Division of the Ministry, and he's next to me, and Ms. Shannon Sacro, Manager of the Air Quality Management Branch of the National Environment and Planning Agency, who will speak on climate action in Jamaica and air quality monitoring, respectively. Just to set the background, the emissions policy framework for Jamaica and the update of the climate change policy framework were both approved by Cabinet as Green Papers in February 2021. Since that time, the Ministry, through the Environment and Risk Management Branch, has been refining the documents and has commenced engagement with the public through a series of consultations which started in October 2021. And just to be clear, the two policies are related but distinct, so the presentations will treat with them as individual policies. However, your input this evening is critical as the Ministry moves to finalize both documents and create the sustainable future we want for ourselves and our children. For those of you who want to familiarize yourselves with the details of each policy, well, you may view them on the website of the Ministry of Economic Growth and Job Creation. And here we go, M-E-G-J-C, M-E-G-J-C, dot gov, dot J-M, forward slash policies. That's M-E-G-J-C, dot gov, dot J-M, forward slash policies. Copies will also be made available at the municipal corporations and public libraries. We want to hear from you. So even if it is that you do not get the chance to speak during this forum, you may send your written comments to policy comments at megjc, that's M-E-G-J-C, dot gov, by March 31 this year. Yes, 2022. 
Apart from the Zoom platform, this virtual event is being streamed to the ministry's social media platforms on Facebook and Twitter, and that's at MEGJC underscore JM. You may also view the consultation on the Jamaica Information Service platforms, that's at JIS News, and on the YouTube for the Jamaica Information Service. Listen, man, we invite your comments and your queries on these platforms. However, for the purpose of this forum, and in the interest of time, only questions concerning the update on the climate change policy and the emissions policy framework will be accepted. I know you understand. If you have queries concerning other environmental matters, we encourage you to send them to the Environment and Risk Management Branch, email er. M B as in banana, that's E R M B as in banana at M E G J C dot gov dot J M. Well, there are a number of presentations to get through, but we had to do that, and much to discuss. So without further ado, I invite Mrs. Audrey V. Sewell, Permanent Secretary in the Ministry of Economic Growth and Job Creation, to, li to deliver her remarks. But before the PS comes, we're going to do a little sanitizing here because we are observing all protocols here at the PBCJ and for this forum. Thank you, Madam Moderator. Ladies and gentlemen, in the room and in virtual land, good evening. The Minister of Economic Growth and Job Creation is delighted to convene this consultation on two very important national policies, the Emissions Policy Framework for Jamaica and the updated Climate Change Policy Framework for Jamaica, both green paper. One may ask, why two separate policies with the recognized linkages between climate change and air quality? The emissions policy framework was developed as a result of a direct mandate from the cabinet. While the government has several policies and legislative instruments in place that address air quality, the cabinet's mandate provided us with an opportunity to develop a focused national policy that presents a more cohesive framework for air quality management in Jamaica. The emissions policy framework seems to provide the requisite policy prescriptions and related actions to address air pollution from key anthropogenic sources. The updated climate change policy framework, however, focuses on climate action in detail. Indeed, the World Health Organization has indicated that reducing short-lived air pollutant emissions, such as methane and black carbon, is one of the most powerful tools available for slowing down near-term climate change and protecting health. A win-win. Hence, the implementation of these two policy frameworks will go hand in hand. Ladies and gentlemen, the 2015 climate change policy framework, while am ambitious, strategic, and the first of its kind for Jamaica, and indeed the wider Caribbean, simply did not preempt some key advancements in the global change agenda. This updated framework, climate change policy framework, therefore, takes into consideration several new and cross-cutting developments, key of which is the Paris Agreement to the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. While adapting to the impacts of climate change remains the priority of small island developing states, such as Jamaica, the Paris Agreement requires greater focus on mitigation actions by all parties. Other developments include changing trends in the transport and energy sectors, 
new or updated policy instruments governing the land, water, and housing sectors, technological advancements, and various shifting national priorities have also shaped this policy. Consequent to the revision of this policy framework, Jamaica now has an improved document that supports the country in pursuing transformative climate action. We have therefore invited you here to support the ministry in ensuring that Jamaica plays its part in contributing to the achievement of the Paris Agreement's goal of limited, limiting global warming to well below two degrees Celsius, preferably to 1.5 degrees Celsius compared to pre-industrial levels. Individuals, companies, and communities are encouraged to arm themselves with the requisite knowledge and information to assist in making informed decisions about the quality life you experience as well as the legacy we will leave for future generations of Jamaicans. With that said, ladies and gentlemen, we thank you for your time and your input. By joining us at this virtual town hall meeting, you have shown your commitment to sustainable and equitable national development. Special thanks to the government of Canada and its improved access to justice in the Caribbean impact justice project, which provided support for the update of the climate change policy framework and all the stakeholders who have provided input thus far for these two important national policies. I am looking forward to a very productive consultation. Again, we thank you and we welcome you to this very important consultation session. Good evening. Thank you, Madam Permanent Secretary. Thank you so very much, Permanent Secretary Audrey Sewell. Just a reminder that the policies may be viewed on the website of the Ministry of Economic Growth and Job Creation at megjc.gov.jm forward slash policies. If you wish to send written comments, you may do so to policy comments at megjc.gov.jm. Well, our next speaker is Senator the Honorable Matthew Samuda, Minister without portfolio in the Ministry of Economic Growth and Job Creation. Senator Samuda has responsibility for the environment, climate change, water, as well as the blue and green economies. And now I invite him to speak on the two policies. But, of course, we'll just sanitize the lecture. Madam Master of Ceremonies, Madam Permanent Secretary, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, good evening. The Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change 2018 Special Report on Global Warming of 1.5 degrees Celsius states that human activities are estimated to have caused approximately 1 degree Celsius of global warming above pre-industrial levels, with a likely range of 0.8 degrees Celsius to 1.2 degrees Celsius. Global warming is likely to reach 1.5 degrees Celsius between 2030 and 2052 if it continues to increase at the current rate. The impacts of a temperature increase above 1.5 degrees Celsius on our ecosystems, critical infrastructure, labor productivity, health and well-being will be significant. The report also speaks to the need for rapid and far-reaching transitions in land, energy, industry, buildings, transport and cities. The science is clear, ladies and gentlemen. This is one of the reasons we have invited you to this public consultation this evening. As stated earlier, this consultation session is the last in a series of public engagements on the Emissions Policy Framework for Jamaica and the update of the Climate Change Policy Framework for Jamaica, being undertaken by the Ministry of Economic Growth and Job Creation. To date, 
the ministry has engaged the public and private sectors as well as civil society. In doing so, we have benefited from significant input from several stakeholders, including youth representatives, environmental practitioners, as well as transport and energy experts. I believe that this session with you today will provide the Ministry with some additional insights to support the finalization of these important national policies, which have been developed to advance the country's sustainable development agenda. Although small economies such as ours do not contribute significantly to global emissions of greenhouse gases, our economies suffer disproportionately with respect to the impacts. The goal of the Paris Agreement to the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change is geared towards holding the increase in the global average temperature to well below 2 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels and pursuing efforts to limit the temperature it increase to 1.5 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels. As such, the 2015 Climate Change Policy Framework has been revised and updated to reflect this ambitious call for greater focus on climate change mitigation and more meaningful, ambitious climate action. The updated Climate Change Policy Framework signals Jamaica's commitment to global climate action as well as concrete actions at the national and local levels. We are also here to discuss the Emissions Policy Framework of, for Jamaica, which gives strategic guidance on improving air quality for our nation. However, permit me to make the distinction which will guide your interaction this evening. The updated Climate Change Policy Framework speaks specifically to addressing detrimental effects of climate change, whereas the Emissions Policy Framework puts forward several objectives strategies and actions to improve mechan the mechanisms that govern air quality management. Some of these actions will reference climate action, but are not intended to focus solely on climate change. The World Health Organization considers air pollution to be the greatest environmental risk to health. The organization has stated that air pollution kills an estimated 7 million people worldwide every year. Data shows that 9 out of 10 people breathe air that exceeds WHO guideline limits containing high levels of pollutants with low and middle income countries like ourselves suffering from the highest exposures. The primary cause of air pollution, as we know, is burning of fossil fuels, is also a major contributor to climate change. The total number of deaths attributed to ambient air pollution in Jamaica in 2016 was estimated to be 695, and climate change continues to pose an existential threat to many, including businesses, critical infrastructure, and ecosystems, coastal resources, livelihoods, and indeed our very way of life. This is all significant, particularly within the context of the global COVID-19 pandemic, which has placed great importance and having a sound, healthy, natural environment to support health and well-being. Many of our industries are affected by poor air quality. Persons with businesses and livelihoods which involve outdoor, outdoor labor-intensive work know how poor air quality severely impacts the productivity of their workers. Those in agriculture know how poor air quality affects plant and animal health. These are issues to be addressed by the Emissions Policy Framework for Jamaica. My team and our partners will go through both policy instruments with you today. However, in your discussions, I ask for your input in identifying the gaps. Whether they are in legislation, research, public awareness raising, technology transfer, or, areas and, or other areas. And I ask you to assist us in identifying additional opportunities for building a collaborative and sustainable approach. We also wish for you to consider all these matters within the context of equitable transitions towards a green economy with green jobs and clean energy for our citizens. In closing, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to express the Minister's gratitude for your time and contributions today and encourage you to continue to take part in the individual and collective actions required to effect positive change. Your participation here today is an excellent example of partnership and collaboration in effect. My ministry looks forward to exchange of ideas and the sharing of knowledge. Thank you, good evening.
Thank you, Minister. I particularly like the fact that you've asked those who are watching, who intend to comment, to help to identify gaps and opportunities. Please remember, you may send off your comments and queries to the Ministry's social media platforms on Facebook and Twitter, and that's at M-E-G-J-C underscore J-M, or to the Jamaica Information Service platforms at J-I-S News and on the J-I-S Information Service YouTube channel. Let us now dive into the meat of the matter, beginning with the emissions policy. For that's emissions framework policy for Jamaica. I now invite Ms. Shannon Sukra, manager of the Air Quality Management Branch of the National Environment and Planning Agency, to set the context for us by speaking to Jamaica's Ambient Air Quality Monitoring Network and State of the Ambient Air Quality Management. Presentation by Mrs. Sukra will happen right after. You know, you get the drill, all right? Sanitization. about Jamaica's ambient air quality network and the state of the ambient air. So Jamaica's, Jamaica's ambient air quality program started in 2010 where we developed what is called our program on Jamaica's air quality management program document. This is a document which spans six years and we'll be talking a little bit about some of that legislation and um, how this fits into the policy framework. So a little bit of background and just a bit in terms of our standards and then we'll go into what our, the status of our air quality is like here in Jamaica. So to begin with, we promulgated the NRCA air quality regulations in 2006 and this regulation actually, thank you, right, this regulation governs major and significant facilities that are required to attain air pollutant discharge licenses. So what this means is that facilities that are emitting above a certain threshold or quantity of pollutants, these are the, these are the facilities that are required under this regulation to attain a license. Separate from that, we also have our standards, and these are our ambient air quality standards, and these are keywords that I want you to pay attention to while I deliver this presentation because what this means is that these are the metrics or these are the parameters that we look at to determine what our ambient air quality is like in Jamaica. So under our regulations that I, that I spoke about before for 2006, the air quality regulations, some of our facilities that are licensed, licensed these facilities are required to conduct ambient air quality monitoring. This monitoring, again, another key takeaway from this presentation, is a shared responsibility. And what this means is that we have a unique framework and a bit similar to some countries like Canada where industry actually does some monitoring and then us regulators at Nepal, we also do some of that monitoring. So it's a shared responsibility. Just a snapshot to show you what some of these pollutants are. The first one I have here is total suspended particulates. And then below that I have what's called PM10. Both of these are the particulate fraction, meaning dust in the ambient air. But these are different sizes. So those that are 10 microns or, or under are the ones that we have designated here as PM10. Other pollutants are listed here, but key to this is that sulfur dioxide, nitrogen dioxide, carbon monoxide, ozone, for instance, these are some of the gases that are emitted and as previously you've heard, these are pollutants that literally you can get when you compost fossil fuels. So we are monitoring for these important parameters. What's our air quality monitoring network like? And now really what we are getting into today to open, you know, kind of set the stage. We have 78 monitors here in our country and um, we actually monitor for TSP, PM10. A little new parameter here for everyone that was, you know, looking at those parameters in that table, PM2.5, which we'll talk about in a bit. Sulfur dioxide, nitrogen dioxide, carbon monoxide, and ozone. So majority of this network is actually owned and operated by the bauxite industry, as you can see. And um, 
at least 75% of these stations overall in our network monitor particulate matter. We'll get into that as well. This just shows you the spatial distribution of our monitors across Jamaica, and you'll see that some of these are located heavily in areas where we have bauxite industries, and also you'll see that our city, our KMA area, and some of our major cities, such as Montego Bay and Mandeville, Kingston, have PM 2.5 monitors. Now, the monitoring objectives in this framework. Why do we monitor air quality? Why do we set a monitor? How do we know what this monitoring um, actually tells us? So there are different types of stations. You have what are called compliance stations, and these stations are different from those that represent population exposure. So what are you exposed to just being in the city in general versus being on the countryside? You have background stations in more pristine areas. You also have special purpose or special monitoring stations. So that everyone can benefit from, you know, what am I talking about here? This is what these stations actually looks, look like. So you have those that are continuous, semi-continuous, and um, this just shows you what particulate measurements or instruments look like, particulate instruments. The gas monitoring devices are housed in what we call shelters. So you may see these actually as you pass by some areas on the road. But um, this is really what it looks like, and you can look out for them now. Now, I had you know, given a little bit about our PM 2.5, just mentioned it to keep our ears open a little. Um, PM 2.5 is not listed in our table as something that we have a standard for. It's not a metric or a parameter that's there in, in our 1996 standards. But why did I mention it? Now, PM 2.5 is 10 to 20 times smaller than a single strand of human hair. So as you can imagine, inhaling a particle of this size can do quite a bit of damage. So this is the fraction that can literally get into your bloodstream. So not to scare you, but just so you can see that we are more forward thinking that even though our standards do need some updating and revision, we are monitoring for better metrics or better parameters to see what our air pollution is like locally. So PM 2.5, we have here some graphs that show you that we're compliant to the US EPA's daily standards. And that little section circled there actually gives you an idea of when we have an unprecedented intrusion. Remember in June 2020, I believe, when we had that massive Sahara dust intrusion, that's when we have those increased readings that you can see have surpassed that daily limit. Now, Another key takeaway from this is that separate from our daily standards, there are also annual standards. And for PM 2.5, we have computed this across some of our urban cities. And you'll see that we have compliance, but we do have one city here for one of our, one of our areas collected in Spanish Town, where we do have some years that are above the standard. And you know, this is just to set some context as to why this policy is needed. So we could see from our data sets that some of this may be linked. And I say may be linked because we're using trends and patterns to deduce this information. And it shows that some of this may be linked to our vehicle emissions. So something for us to work on and target. And again, this, this just shows you a bit to what those trends look like. And you can see the top blue line is a little different. That morning peak, afternoon peak, typical in air quality for air quality for vehicle emissions. Now before closing off, you can see that our other parameters here, this one is PM10, the larger size fraction. We do have some areas that are outside of the standard. And this actually, I see a bit of a shift here on that line, which should really be down a bit, down at 50. We do have some sites that are over the annual standard. So some of these sites we have certain plans in place. Now, in addition to this, I did mention gases as metrics that we monitor. And on a good note, we have found full compliance with the gases. So while we do have concern for PM, full compliance with our gases. The important thing with the gases, though, is that we do know that we have some work to do as it relates to formation of PM 2.5 from these gases. We can discuss that if needed. Now, 
In summary, PM remains our pollutant of concern with our vehicle emissions, industrial emissions, open burning, these anthropogenic sources being areas we need to target. And what are the major initiatives that we, will, we are undertaking here at NEPO? We have expanded the monitoring network, as you can see, to include better spatial coverage, better metrics, more specialized monitoring. And we've also started even new innovative monitoring methods to, inc to include inclusion of satellite data, low-cost sensors to just improve our reach. We've also been working on procuring more funding so we can provide a wider reach for our public, provide more what's called the air quality index for our Jamaican people to know how to respond when we're getting, for instance, an intrusion of Saharan dust. And lastly, again, here what we're, what we're here today about, the legislation governing air quality management in Jamaica, review of these documents. And last, but by far not least, the fact that we have done strategic action management plans for areas that are showing degrading air quality. And we're looking forward to working through our policy to have major improvements in these areas. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ms. Sukra. So dust has different sizes. Remember that, okay? Dust has different sizes. Thank you. There is a saying, you know, that the best public policy is made when you are listening to the people who are going to be impacted. So we're going to invite you to make your voices heard on these two policies. But I want to make two quick announcements before I continue. Both our permanent secretary and our minister have some other activities that they must attend to. So when they leave, don't think that they're gone and then forget about me, just that they have to go to some other duties. Am I correct? All right, so I just want to bear that in mind. And guess what? I begin to see the questions start coming in already. Uh, just a quick one that I will deal with before I continue here. For the person who asks, where can you find the documents? Just go to the website, megjc, that's megjc dot gov dot jm forward slash policies forward slash. That's megjc dot gov dot jm forward slash policies. All right, so apart from this Zoom platform, you may also send your comments and queries to the ministry on their Facebook and Twitter pages at megjc underscore jm and on the Jamaica Information Services platforms at JIS News and on the YouTube for Jamaica Information Service on the, their YouTube channel. Now, the Acting Chief Technical Officer in the Ministry of Economic Growth and Job Creation, Ms. Gillian Guthrie, was instrumental to the drafting of the Emissions Policy Framework for Jamaica. I'm not going to invite her to give an overview of the policy, but please remember that you may also view the policy in depth on the website of the Ministry of Economic Growth and Job Creation. Say it again, because they just want you to know that they need your input. Megjc.gov.jm forward slash policies. All right, so we're making way for Ms. Guthrie. Um, good evening and thank you very much. Um, the Ministry is looking forward to this consultation on some key national policy. In February 2017, the Cabinet directed that the Greenhouse Emissions Policy Framework be developed by the Ministry of Economic Growth and Job Creation in collaboration with several key ministries, the Transport and Mining Ministry, the Science, Energy and Technology Ministry, and the Ministry of Tourism. Um, during that time, um, an Emissions Policy Steering Committee was um, um, convened, comprising of subject matter experts from the Ministry of Transport and Mining, the Ministry of Science, Energy and Technology, the Ministry of Tourism, the Ministry of Health, the then Ministry of Local Government and Community Development, and the National Environment and Planning Agency. 
Uh, representation was also sought from the National Solid Waste Management Authority and the Bureau of Standards Jamaica. And this group met over a course of 10 months, and that is the group that was charged with um, developing what we have in front of us now, the emissions policy framework. We also had an emissions policy, um, policy steering committee that reported to the Interministerial Committee, which met in June of 2017. So we actually had the input of the ministers in developing these important um, policies. It's important to note when we talk about emissions, and in fact our permanent secretary spoke about it, that there is a strong link between climate change and air quality. In fact, the Burning of fossil fuels is the primary source of climate warming emissions and a major contributor to health damaging air pollution. And many of the drivers of climate change, such as inefficient and polluting forms of energy and transport systems, also contribute to air pollution. Actions that reduce greenhouse gas emissions, and particularly those that target short lived climate pollutants, such as methane and carbon black, can generate immediate health benefits and slow climate change. And when we talk about emissions and air quality, we're talking about some the entrepreneurial sources, such as from the energy sector, the transport sector, the industry, agricultural sector, and waste management, as well as land use. There are several risks associated that um, we would like to, to go to. Um, risk to rates of infections and non-communicable diseases, antimicrobial resistance, biodiversity loss and water scarcity. There's an urgency to act. Pollution can cause lung cancer, heart disease, pulmonary disease, stroke, mental and neurological conditions, and acute respiratory infections. And we, we know all about that um, when many times during the year we have um, waves of respiratory um, infections. Air pollution, pollution kills an estimated 7 million people, and Minister Samuda spoke about that. 4.2 million deaths as a result of exposure to ambient air pollution worldwide every year. And 91% of the world's population live in places where, where pollution exceeds WHO guideline limits. So this issue of air quality and air pollution is not unique to Jamaica, but all countries are required to put the necessary measures in place to address air pollution in trying to protect human health and the environment. There are also issues of equity and vulnerable communities. Uh, pollution must, most harmful impacts on human health are typically borne by the most vulnerable um, groups. And children suffer long-term impacts in development as well as people with medical conditions, older persons with disabilities, and those living in poorer socioeconomic conditions. So what is that risk? Today's poor air quality is threatening the survival of more than one million of the planet's estimated eight million plant and animal species. And this might be a startling figure, but this is a reality. Pollution also threatens our biodiversity and significantly contributes to the ongoing mass extinction of species together with changes in land and sea use. Overexploitation of natural resources, climate change, and invasive alien species Pollution is one of the five main drivers of biodiversity loss. Economic progress and pollution reduction can happen concurrently. Between 2000 and 2017, the EU's GDP grew by 32%, while emissions of the main air pollutants decreased by 10%. So this is a best case scenario for Jamaica. The economic case for acting on pollution is clear and the benefits for society far outweigh the cost, just as the cost of inaction hugely outweigh the cost of action. So the purpose and outcomes of an emissions policy framework, there are several. We are looking for effective management of air emissions from anthropogenic sources, and I should pause here to say that this particular policy will deal with um, anthropogenic sources, man-made sources of air pollution, not um, naturally occurring sources such as volcanic ash, for instance. Um, also, another purpose that we are striving towards with these policies towards the protection of human health, environment, and productivity of the labor force, and the environment in fulfillment of commitments on the Vision 2030 Jamaica National Development Plan, the 
constitution as well because you know there in a paragraph there's a paragraph in the constitution that speaks to the right to a healthy environment as well as the country's obligations on the regional and global agreements and arrangements related to air quality and climate change and some of the key expected outcomes are a more synergistic response across both the public and private sectors including the energy industry and transport sectors in the areas of environment and climate change facilitates strategic collaboration in data sharing and other actions and establish common but differentiated responsibilities resulting in co-benefits across sectors and these co-benefits include but are not limited to reduction in harmful emissions including greenhouse gases and ozone improved air quality improved public health healthy ecosystems and awareness raising development planning in respect of transport settlements and other key elements in long-term nation building the scope of the policy so we are as i said before we will focus on anthropogenic sources of um, air pollution but also we want to say that we are going to focus on ambient air pollution so outdoor air pollution as opposed to air pollution within households the policy seeks to address, among other things, the management of emissions from key sources, industrial processes such as power generation, land, air, and sea transportation, waste disposal and treatment, land use and biomass burning, agricultural byproducts, and residential and commercial sources. The policy framework will provide directives regarding how the state will approach its responsibilities for ensuring environmentally sound management of emissions, within Jamaica, including a monitoring and reporting and evaluation framework, which identifies roles and responsibilities of the coordinated um, execution of the policy. So Jamaica is not short um, of policies and legislation. And in fact, many of our policy, uh, legislation, unfortunately, are in some cases outdated. And this is some of the things that we would like to address in um, finalizing this emissions policy framework. And we also have um, several institutions that deal directly with air quality. So, in fact, Ms. Sukras spoke about the air quality regulations under the Natural Resources Conservation Authority Act. We also have the Public Health Nuisance Regulations, the Clean Air Act. Uh, we also have the Country Fires Act. So, um, so all of these pieces of legislation in some way, shape or form speak to issues related to air quality. Very importantly, we have the Road Traffic Act, so because the emissions from the transport sector is a key source of air pollution. So, and their regulations were recently promulgated under that act. And there, there is legislation being developed on the, for shipping um, to deal with air emissions from the shipping sector. So to go on to the policy itself. So we have a vision statement here. And in fact, what we are looking forward to is for the public to engage with us in reviewing the document identifying those gaps, identifying opportunities as well, so that we can refine the document, so that we can have a policy document that responds to the Jamaican situation, where we are, but where we would like to get to. So the vision that we have in our draft policy is a healthy and productive Jamaica with clean air in keeping with a low carbon development pathway in support of economic growth, social well-being, and environmental sustainability. So this is a, a mouthful, but we came up with this vision because it's aligned, we believe, to section paragraph 13.3L of the Charter of Fundamental Rights and Freedom that speaks to the right to a healthy environment. We also believe that it is aligned to uh, Vision 2030, National Development Plan, specifically Goal 4, Jamaica has a healthy natural environment, and takes into account the Agenda 2030 and its Sustainable Development Goals, particularly Goals 3 on good health and well-being, 7 on affordable and clean energy, 11 on sustainable cities and communities, 12 on res responsible consumption and production, and 13 on climate action. Um, the goal of the policy, effective and coordinated systems for the reduction of emissions from key pollutant sources and maintenance of good air quality throughout Jamaica. 
And it has a number of principles, in fact, nine principles, and they are all listed there. Sustainable development, environmental stewardship, the polluter pays principle, which is something that we are promoting, the precautionary approach, meaning that you don't need to have scientific um, data and evidence to act, um, coherence and collaboration, the public right to know, and this is very important because we want to arm the population with the requisite information and knowledge so that they can make informed decisions going forward and participate actively in the decision-making process. It also speaks to accountability and transparency, best science, and adherence to global commitments. The policy also has six objectives, and they are all listed here, and I'm going to take you now through each of the objectives. So the first objective that we have is um, to coordinate approaches to the reduction of emissions. And the first um, strategy under that objective is improved communication among the public sector agencies that guide policies that may have a direct or indirect impact on emissions. And here we are talking about a collaborative approach between and among those public sector agencies that have the mandate to regulate um, air quality in the country. Um, also, another um, strategy under that objective is to ensure that current information and data on emissions, including the approved national communications, and this is a report that we prepare um, in response to our commitments under the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, the Biannual Update Report, another report for the Climate Change Convention, and Jamaica's nationally determined contribution, all under the Climate Change Convention. Uh, very importantly, and in fact, I encourage um, persons to visit the Planning Institute of Jamaica's website because we actually have state of the, the climate reports um, on the website, and that can help you to inform yourselves about what is the state of the Jamaican climate and how you, you can participate and get actively involved. And there are also state of the environment reports, and those state of the environment reports also include a section on issues related to air quality. Another sub-objective is to establish institutional arrangements for coordinated approaches to the prevention and reduction of emissions. And under this, we want to establish what we call a National Air Quality Management Board. And this board would um, comprise of the relevant ministries, departments, and agencies, the medical sector, civil society actors, um, academia, and NGOs, all sitting together to talk about how it is that we address the issues and concerns related to air pollution in the country and the responses that we should and strategies that we should employ. We also want to establish clear relationships and strengthen linkages between key entities. Of course, when we establish the National Air Quality Management Board, we also have though to create linkages with existing entities such as the Climate Change Advisory Board, the Air Quality Management Committee, which is a committee of the NRCA, and relevant thematic working groups on the Vision 2030 and other government-led committees. So we want an integrated and collaborative approach. We don't want to duplicate effort, and we want to be very efficient in the utilization of resources. We want to strengthen the capacities of the relevant MDs to monitor and regulate emission-producing um, activities. And we also want to expand the air quality monitoring network through the inclusion of and partnership with the relevant regulatory agencies. And Ms. Sukra, in her presentation, spoke a little bit about what NEPA is currently doing in expanding the air quality monitoring network. A third um, strategy is to enhance policy coherence through the consultative approach, particularly engaging the private sector and local communities. And we also want to further, uh, in another strategy, identify and implement critical actions for reducing emissions, including the use of incentives related to environmentally friendly equipment and practices. Of course, um, we, here we want to talk a little bit about how it is that we promote um, the transformation in key sectors that also have a, a key role to play in terms of our air pollution. So for instance, the transport sector and promoting um, electric vehicles um, as opposed to fossil fuel based vehicles um, um, to, to allow us to reduce our emissions from that sector. 
Another key strategy is the active engagement of non-state actors in, in approaches to reduce emissions. And here we're talking about establishing channels for communication with the private sector on issues related to the emissions control, engaging the scientific and academic, academic communities in developing innovative approaches to emissions reduction, and in communicating information on emissions, and sensitizing and actively engaging the public on actions that may be taken at the individual or community levels to reduce or prevent harmful emissions. For our second goal, we want to review existing laws, objectives, reviews, existing laws and promulgate as necessary new or amended legislation to address the source of emissions of air pollution. And in fact, I had said before, Jamaica has um, a suite of legislation that deals with air emissions. Some of them are outdated and we will have to do a review to be sure that the legislative framework responds to the Jamaican situation. So one of the things we want to do is to finalize and promote in the short term the legislation governing emissions testing of motor vehicles. The idea is that uh, we would do emissions um, a tailpipe testing as part of the fitness regime that the fleet goes through on, on an annual basis. And we want to review existing um, legislation, again, to bring them up to date, um, particularly the Air Quality, air, the Clean Air Act, the Country Fires Act, the Public Health Regulations, and other such um, pieces of legislation. And we want to finalize legislation related to emissions from ships. And we also want to levy taxes on high emitting e equipment and also address issues related to um, air quality advisory and bulletins to the public. So we want to be able to, on an ongoing basis, share information with the public on the state of um, the, the country's air quality. A second strategy under the second objective is to develop and implement strategies, um, actions and medium-term programs that focus on reducing emissions of air pollution, taking into account the impact on natural resources and human health, and here we want to also look at improving, for instance, garbage, garbage collection and disposal to reduce and, where possible, eliminate open burning within residential communities. And I have to pause here because there is actually a, an order under the NRC Act that speaks to issues related to open burning. And so greater enforcement is, is required in that regard. Um, we also want to talk about finalizing the an implementation of a bushfire um, index for Jamaica to allow for preemptive work to prevent or curb potential bush and forest fires from natural causes, um, for example, lightning strikes. So in looking at strengthening the mechanisms for effective management of emissions that affect human health and the environment, we want to update and effectively implement the air quality management program, which I spoke to you before, develop and implement an air quality index, including meteorological and climate data, which we want to share with the public on an ongoing basis, prepare air shed management plans, and Ms. Sukra would have shown you um, graphs where we have some concerns about some of the corridors in our urban centers that we need to address from an air quality standpoint. And carrying out epidemiological studies with priority given to those communities exposed to high levels of air pollutants and disseminate the results to stakeholders concerned. Our third objective is to increase education awareness on air quality issues to facilitate public participation in the protection of their health and the natural and built environment. We want to increase public education and awareness of the impacts of emissions on human health and the natural and built environment. And we want to provide and make available data and information on emissions of air pollutants, including the annual ambient air quality reports. So we want the public to be armed with the requisite information so that they can actively participate in the decision-making process. As, uh, another strategy that we have, and uh, on the, uh, this one now on the objective four, which is to increase advocacy for the reduction of emissions in regional and international fora. We want to provide support to regional institutions and civil society for enhanced advocacy. 
And we recognize that um, civil society in particular um, has an important role to play in terms of helping us to communicate the message to the general public and to help us to galvanize action at the local level. And so we want to empower civil society to continue to play that role. On the objective five, which is to identify and pursue opportunities for funding and technical assistance for the management of air quality, we want to develop a framework for identifying funding opportunities for reduction of emissions. And we, one of the things we wanted to point out here is to promote the development and use of investment tools to finance environmentally friendly projects, including, among other things, green bonds. Also on the objective six, which is to establish effective systems of research and data collection, we want to improve and maintain the national air quality database. And one of the things we also wanted to do is to facilitate the development of targets and indicators in alignment with the goal of the Paris Agreement. We want to strengthen, very importantly, NEPA's capacity to collect data to facilitate, among other things, reporting on the environmental agreements, including on greenhouse gas emissions. But we also want NEPA to be in a position to be able to share information on the country's air quality um, in a very real way with the general public. I want to now take you to um, what we propose to be the institutional structure in terms of air pollution. Um, we already have a climate change advisory board which exists. We want to have, um, when we establish a national air quality management board, which I spoke to you about earlier, we want a strong linkage between these two bodies. And these two bodies, of course, will report to the ministry with responsibility for environment and climate change. And that ministry has a relationship with the thematic working groups of Vision 2030. And all of that information and recommendations as to how we address the issues, air quality um, issues, will go to Cabinet for, for a decision. So in a nutshell, um, I try to take you through the key um, areas of the draft emissions policy framework. Again, the ministry invites you to read the document in great detail. Please provide us with your feedback where we have gaps, where we can strengthen the document in other areas, where we have totally missed um, some elements which are key to a, an effective policy. We would like to hear from you. And so um, we invite you again, as our moderator said, to send those comments, the policy comments, at megjc.gov.jm. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chief Technical Director Guthrie. That was quite comprehensive. And let me just uh, quickly remind us that throughout the presentations, you've been told of the importance of being informed so you can help with filling gaps or uh, stating what you think opportunities are. And also, um, you know, I'm so glad you spoke about the open burning in resi uh, residential communities and the order. It is something that we all need to pay attention to, this burning, burning, burning. The air quality database, I'm looking forward to that. And of course, the air quality board. I, I can't recall if I heard you because I was monitoring if you said that on that board you'd have somebody from the agricultural sector. Medical, what you need to put some money for agriculture sector on it too. So I'm filling a gap, okay? I'm filling a gap. Thank you so very much. Uh, we will now be taking some questions, and a whole pile of things have been coming in, you know, <laughs> questions from Zoom, and um, uh, we are joined online uh, by um, Anthony McKenzie, Director of Environmental Management Conservation Division at Nepal, who is one of the resource persons who will assist us in answering the question. So let me tell you. There are so many questions. I hope you're ready. This was one from Zoom. We heard a lot about air quality in relation to burning fossil fuels, but what about bauxite mining? Who's going to take that? I don't know why they're looking at our friend from Nepal. I can go ahead. <laughs> no problem. Go ahead. Thank, Mr. thank you very much for that question. So it's a very good question, and Miss um, Guthrie did go quite a bit into into water or or current legislation is 
And um, remember I spoke a bit about major and significant facilities and that these are facilities that we currently have what's called an air pollutant discharge license. Now what's in the key takeaway from this is that under the, the emissions policy framework for Jamaica, we will look at any updates that we need under our NRCA air quality regulations, the Jamaica Air Quality Management Program, the, annu the actual ambient standards. So remember I showed you what we call pollutants and I pointed out, you know, we have TSP, the larger dust, we have PM10, we have PM2.5. So what it means is that review of all these important legislation will be critical and under this policy we can improve on what we already have and bauxite mining will be one of those categories that will be further covered in addition to what we have at the moment. Right, and let me just acknowledge Antoinette Aiken, who is here interpreting for the deaf and the hard of hearing. Very important, we want to say thanks for that act that was passed on February 14. Yes, many things need to be done, but at least that's there. And if you operate a business or something like that, you need to play your part for people with disabilities to get into your place. All right, let me go back here now. It's so many of these things. And I want to, let me, that was Zoom. Let me go down to, oh, more coming in. From Facebook, uh, can filtration units be added to lower emission levels? My question, I would have a question though, no, unfortunately. I, know, I think that your mic is rubbing against something, am I correct? Oh. Is it rubbing against something? Maybe when I took the mask off? No, you, not, no? I'm coming over there to fast. Sure, sure. <laughs> I'm not certain, I think it's on our clothes. Right, so I, I do believe that question is indoor air pollution related. Um, I'm just thinking from the, the context of how it was raised. Yes. Um, so I'm, I'm more of an outdoor air pollution expert, but in the context of indoor air, yes, there are some filters that you, you can use, and you can get more information from that from the Ministry of Health. Um, what I can tell you though is that if that question was outdoor pollution related, some of those instruments that I would have showed you, that is actually a part of how these instruments are designed and how they work. So remember we have the TSP, the big dust, then you have the PM10, the one that is 10 microns, you can see this size, and then the 2.5 which is really fine, smaller than my hair strand, you can't see. So how these instruments operate is that they're actually what are called impactors or filters or sections in the machine that separate the dust into these size fractions. So if it was an outdoor air pollution question, yes, our instruments do separate into the fractions or sizes that we want to measure. So that's how we're able to quantify or determine, you know, what is that amount in our ambient air. Thank you so much. And when you speak about outdoors, the same thing you mean by ambient, right? Yes. See that very, now? very good point. Educating <laughs> man, we have to use a language that the people use. Right. Question, and this one is Facebook, I believe. Was any study done on the type of gas emissions that are released from disposal sites? See that all? A good question. <laughs> and and I'll, I'll go ahead with taking, yes. taking that one. So we don't have a detailed study that has been done, but what we do have is what's called an emissions inventory. So we have done, in partnership with some other agencies and, and through some other funding, we have done some projects where we've quantified, you know, what are the levels of pollutants that we expect to come from some of these areas. So it feeds into what we call our national emissions inventory database. So we'll know what quantity of a specific pollutant, you know, we anticipate is being emitted. I use the word anticipate because these are estimates. So if that question was related to direct measurement, that is different. Um, emissions, if you think of it as how much money you have in your account, um, the emission would be, say, a specific amount. So one gram when you're baking, one ton when you're baking. So it's a quantity that, say, you get from, say, the waste disposal site. But when that goes off into the ambient or outdoor air, then that creates what you call a concentration. So yes, we would have studies that have some estimates of what those emissions are that are coming from the facility. And now we're moving towards a point of quantifying more 
what is in the ambient air. So we do have some levels in and around some areas, but not a lot of detail. So yes, we have some information. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Sukra. Now this one, I think I'm going back to Zoom, says, how will providers of environmentally friendly technologies gain access to agencies to facilitate faster uptake and scale? Will policy support efficient, coordinated, and effective permitting, commissioning, and deployment of zero emission technologies in Jamaica? That's so like Ms. Guthrie, yes. Chief Technical yeah. Director. That's <laughs> technical bad. <laughs> Thank you very much for that question. Yes, the policy um, does advocate for incentives for persons or companies to make that transition. Um, we want, um, and also, it also advocates penalizing um, companies that have high emitting equipment. So there's a carrot and a stick approach. Um, we want to also encourage innovation so where we can have innovation in terms of how it is that we manage our emissions from the various sectors, we want to encourage that as well. So um, we, we, we are applying different types of modalities, trying to be sure that we address all, all of the factors related to our air quality. Thank you. Here's another. In the Air Quality Board, will civil society and the public be part of the board? How will the public be engaged on an ongoing basis? Right. So civil society will be a part of the board. And the idea is that um, we will be making, re that board will be making recommendations to the cabinet through the ministry with responsibility for environment and climate change. And once it gets to the cabinet, we will then get to the parliament where all of that information will be public. And so from that forum, we'll be trying through the parliament and outside of the parliament to engage the public. So it is going to be a, a looped approach, you know, not just an up, upward approach, but we want feedback and input into the board's work and back to the public again. So it would be an ongoing basis. And we want to, through the board also, to provide the public with information on, on the air quality. We want them to be armed with that information so they can make decisions, they can advocate for themselves. Because sometimes what is happening in the community mm -hmm. around them, they can also take steps to um, help to mitigate the adverse effects of some of these air pollution, like the open burning, the backyard burning that some people engage so in. So that simply so, means so everybody have to be responsible and considerate and remember that this is not a joke business. So nobody light no fire, but you get rid of mosquito. Right, so, so we want the public to be actively engaged in also helping us to monitor the, the, the air quality, but also to participate in reducing the emissions. Thank you. You know, this burning thing is very, I'm asthmatic. And when it takes off near me, because it does, I'm in trouble. All right, let's go now. D the person says, I didn't see or hear much about medical and e-waste. Also, burning of waste significantly impacts on air quality. How is the policy seeking to address issues beyond dialogue? Okay, so there are many things that um, are ongoing that will impact the, the, the policy. Um, we are trying to encourage the public and also through the NSWMA and, and the Ministry of Local Government and Rural Development, a separation at source policy, whereby the fraction of the waste that really needs to be disposed of at the disposal site will go there, where we can have um, other components of the waste sent for recycling, for instance, or we can compost the waste because a lot of the waste that we generate is organic. Um, we should do that. So that is being encouraged there. So we only want a small fraction of the waste that requires disposal at official disposal sites um, across the country to go there, where we can recycle, where we can reuse, where we can compost. That is also being encouraged. We do not advocate for anyone to be burning waste. Right? There is it doesn't matter what kind no, of waste. No burning of the waste is, is to be is allowed. It is not healthy for for you the individual and for the community that is exposed to the emissions from the burning of waste. Thank you, Chief Technical Director Guthrie. We have one last question. There are many other questions, but we have to go after this one to the, the section on climate change because this one was just emissions framework policy. How will the policy support expansion of green hydrogen waste conversion to green energy and fuels? 
So this is what I, I talked a little bit about, the innovation. So we want um, to encourage innovation. We want um, the technological advancements that will allow us to um, change from the high emitting sectors. Those high emitting sectors, we want to bring in those green technologies that will allow them to reduce their emissions. So you want to just quickly say what we mean by green technology? So we want um, inputs, for instance, the inputs into industries, we want them to be such that when it comes to the end of life or the waste, it is reduced. We want a circular approach to where companies can put the waste back into production. And the you end know? of life and is the end of life in the manu manufacturing right, cycle. Right, in the circle. manufacturing cycle. But where you have the waste from it, where you can incorporate that waste back into the, the into operations to reduce the amount that needs for disposal, that is what we are going to encourage. And then you have... Um, equipment and technologies that actually reduce what is emitted. You can have um, sequestration of the emissions um, that, that, are, that are coming from industrial processes. So all of this is what we are encouraging um, with the emissions policy framework. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for your questions. And remember, if you didn't hear your question answered, then send it through because they will be making arrangements to uh, address all your questions and comments. Now, Remember, in addition to the Zoom platform, we may also, you may also send your comments and queries to the ministry on their Facebook and Twitter pages at megjc underscore dot com and the Jamaica Information Services platforms at JIS News and on the YouTube channel, Jamaica Information Service. We now go into the second policy under discussion this evening, the update on the climate change policy framework. With me in studio to make the presentations on this policy are Mr. Ajani Aleen, Research and Development Officer of the Climate Change Division of the Ministry, who will speak first on the topic Climate Action in Jamaica. He'll be followed by Ms. Nicole Origio, Acting Senior Director of the Environment and Risk Management Branch at the Ministry, who will provide an overview of the update of the climate change policy for Jamaica. Remember, you may view the two policies in depth on the website of the Ministry of Economic Growth and Job Creation, MEGJC, MEGJC.gov.jm forward slash policies. We'll be right carrying on after we do the little uh, sanitization here. Thank you for that introduction. So... As stated, I'll be doing the presentation on climate action in Jamaica. So Jamaica as a small island developing state is particularly vulnerable to the impacts of climate change. According to the 2019 State of Jamaica Climate Draft Report, Jamaica has projected to have temperature increases, which means the island will get hotter faster and will have more warm days and nights. We'll see less rainfall. Um, sea levels will continue to rise at a faster rate than before and stronger hurricanes. So in these images taken from the same report, we can see a summary of annual mean temperature across the island for the 2050s, that's in years, and end of the century. As we can see, temperature, temperatures are expected to increase drastically over time. These images are showing a summary of percentage change of annual rainfall for the 2050s and end of the century. As you can see, there will be less and less rainfall causing more frequent drought conditions. So since 1999 to 2021, the cost of extreme events such as hurricanes, droughts, floods, etc. cost Jamaica approximately 128 billion Jamaican dollars or 1.3% of GDP. So um, pertaining to Jamaica's national circumstance or context, the drivers of the mandate for climate action are the Paris Agreement, the Vision 2030 Jamaica National Development Plan, the State of Jamaica Climate Report, the National Determined Contribution, the Climate Change Policy Framework, and the National Communications. So the Climate Change Division within the Ministry has administrative oversight for climate change initiatives and obligations under the UNFCCC and the Paris Agreement. Um, our strategic objectives are to develop and maintain appropriate policies, enhance resilience to climate change, increase education, training and awareness of climate change, strengthen climate 
studies, scenarios, and research, improve the efficiency and coordination of climate change strategies, increase availability of climate change funding, and establish a monitoring evalu and evaluation framework for climate change adaptation and mitigation. So why are we updating, this, um, up, updating the climate change policy framework? So as mentioned previously, the um, policy before was completed in 2015. Jamaica became a party to the Paris Agreement in 2017. So this policy framework will reflect this commitment more, um, and reality more fulsomely. An updated policy framework will further provide guidance and direction to the national agenda and will, prov and will provide confidence to the investors, donors moving forward. It also presents a basis for increasing Jamaica's level of ambition in mitigating and adapting to climate change, including implementation of the NDC and elaboration of a long-term low-carbon climate resilience strategy, or LTS for short. So continuing, um, COP26 took place in Glasgow, UK, and it, it was, uh, took place last year. The Paris Agreement work program was subsequently adopted, and this signaled the start of the Paris Agreement being in implementation mode. So coming out of COP, key climate, climate financing opportunities are expected in short to medium term. For example, a $100 million USD pilot program, which Jamaica would take part in, which would um, test access to finance initiatives in Jamaica. Um, access to finance, of course, therefore will be centered in the updated climate change policy framework and NDC implementation plan, as well as availability of technical support. So a few projects on climate change are being implemented to support the framework, such as the readiness projects, which are being funded by the Green Climate Fund Readiness Facility. Um, these projects include the Red Plus, uh, reduced emission from deforestation and forest degradation. We have the Green Bond Listing Project and the Gender Responsive Approach to Climate Change Adaptation and Mitigation Project. Other projects include the NDC um, Facility Support, which was funded by the World Bank to um, develop an NDC Implementation Plan for Jamaica and a 2050 Low Emission and Climate Resilience Strategy. Other projects um, include the Climate Action Enhancement Package Program or activities, which was used to enhance the NDC by raising ambition and fast-tracking implementation of that enhanced NDC. We also have the um, CBIP project, Capacity Building, for, um, Capacity Building Initiative for Transparency, and we have the National Adaptation Plan Readiness Proposal and the lo Local Climate Adaptive Living Facility Project. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lean. Just a quick reminder that you may post your questions, and I see a few have started to come in already on Facebook or Twitter at the MEGJC underscore JM and Jamaica Information Service uh, at GIS News and their YouTube channel. Our final presenter for the evening, and after that we'll be going to your questions, is Ms. Nicole Origio, Acting Senior Director of the Environment and Risk Management Branch of the Ministry, who will take us through the update to the climate change policy for Jamaica. Listen up. Good morning, everyone. A question that we're often asked is why we're undertaking an update of the 2015 climate change policy framework. For those of you who had joined us when the Minister Samuda was speaking and Permanent Secretary Sewell, they would have mentioned that there have been various changes in the international climate change agenda and national priorities. One of the key drivers for the update is the Paris Agreement under the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change. Now, Jamaica signed this, this agreement in 2016 and ratified it in 2017. And this, the 2015 policy framework actually just 
tabled a few months before that. Now, this means that Jamaica, along with other developing country parties, will have a number of commitments to undertake ambitious efforts to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. And so we've now rescoped the policy to have a bit greater focus on mitigation, research, data collection, technology transfer needs, and also there have been a number of different national changing national priorities. This includes changes in the policy and legislative agenda, in transportation, energy, natural resources and the built environment, including forestry, water, air quality management and housing. And these changes, some of them have been instituted since the 2015 climate change policy framework was tabled. Also, and a, a note to be very proud of, the goal of the 2015 climate change policy really focused on institutional strengthening. And we have, fortunately, a climate change division in place, a climate change focal point network, and a climate change advisory board. And so, by and large, we've achieved the, the goal of the 2015 um, policy framework. Now, just to set a little context, I spoke about changing national priorities. I'm just going to go through a few with you here. Um, there, in the forestry sector, we have a 2017 forest policy for Jamaica. There's also a national forest management and conservation plan, 2016 to 2021. And the ministry is currently undertaking amendments to the Forest Act. In the energy sector, of course, there's the national energy policy and five of its sub-policies. And importantly, the emissions policy framework for Jamaica that we spoke of earlier today. In terms of biodiversity, we have the National Strategy and Action Plan on Biological Diversity in Jamaica 2016 to 2021. We have the Protected Air System Master Plan. We have an overarching policy, policy for Jamaica's protected areas systems and a proposed overarching protected areas legislation as well. In terms of disaster risk management, there is a Disaster Risk Management Act 2015. In terms of phys physical planning, there's a Building Act 2018. In terms of the water sector now, we have revised policy guidelines on rainwater harvesting in draft, and we also have a national water sector policy and implementation plan finalized in 2019. And in terms of marine resources, we have a 2002 national policy on oceans and coastal zone management. In the fishery sector, we have a 2018 Fisheries Act, in terms of agriculture, we have the National Seed Policy and Action Plan. Uh, we have an agricultural land utilization policy in draft. In transportation, very importantly, there's a 2018 Road Traffic Act. And the Ministry with Responsibility for Transport is or is about to begin revision of its national transport policy. We spoke earlier about the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change and the Paris Agreement. Um, but there are other global and regional agreements and institutions that impact the context in which we updated this climate change policy framework. These would include, of course, the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. And these would include the Sustainable Development Goals related to affordable and clean energy, sustainable cities and communities, responsible consumption and production, climate action, of course, life before, below water, and life on land. Additionally, the, the Jamaica is a party to the Montreal Protocol on Substances that Deplete the Ozone Layer. There is also the Sendai Framework for Disaster Risk Reduction, 2015 to 2030. And there are also institutions as well. There's one we call the Five Cs, it's the Caribbean Community Climate Change Center. And there's also a Caribbean Regional Climate Center and a Caribbean Catastrophe Risk Insurance Facility. Now getting a bit more into the meat of the matter, this revised policy is underpinned by nine principles. The 2015 policy had eight, and we actually added a ninth on equality and non-discrimination to ensure that the work we take in climate action takes into consideration vulnerable communities, the disabled, and so on. Now, the vision of the cl updated climate change policy framework I want you to pay very close attention to this because we want some feedback on the vision, goals, and objectives of this document. The vision is Jamaica achieves its goals of sustain sustained growth and prosperity for its people with enhanced resilience and capacity to adapt to the impacts and to mitigate the causes of climate change.
Now, the 2015 climate change policy had one goal. This revised policy has three. I'll go through them briefly. The first one is strengthening of Jamaica's adaptive capacity and resilience to reduce its vulnerability to climate change. The second goal is the pursuit of low carbon development and enhancement of access to and mobilization of climate finance. And the third and final goal is promotion of public education and awareness raising, research and technology transfer towards ambitious climate action. Now to speak a bit about our objectives. There are seven policy objectives and these objectives are aligned to the relevant goals which we just spoke about earlier. So in relation to the goal on strengthening of Jamaica's adaptive capacity, we have an objective on governance and this objective speaks to improving the governance framework for climate action and ensuring transparency and accountability. There is also an objective on adaptation, and this objective speaks to reducing Jamaica's vulnerability and increasing Jamaica's capacity to respond to the harmful impacts of climate change. There are also two objectives that underpin goal two, which is the goal on pursuit of low carbon development and enhancement of ac and access to mobilization of climate finance. The two objectives are, one is on mitigation, this speaks to reducing Jamaica's overall greenhouse gas emissions towards low carbon development. And the second objective is on finance. And this objective speaks to facilitating the access to and mobilization of climate financing for adaptation and mitigation. There are three objectives aligned to goal three. The first one is on public education, awareness and education. And this objective speaks to increase, increasing Jamaica's public awareness of climate change impacts, climate actions, and responses at the national and local levels to facilitate behavior change. The second objective related to goal three is on research. And this speaks to promoting research, innovation, data collection, analyses, and facilitate projections at the national level on climate change, its impacts, and appropriate adaptation and mitigation measures to inform decision making and strategic action at all levels, a very long one. The third and final objective related to goal three is on technology transfer. And this speaks to promoting the transfer of environmentally sound technologies for mitigating and adapting to climate change with other countries and international organizations and among the public sector, private sector entities, financial institutions, non-governmental organizations, and research and education institutions. Now I'm going to speak a little bit about this, the strategies. There are three strategies that give effect to the objective on governance. And if you're following along with us, and I hope you are, we are on page 45 of the document. The first strategy, which speaks to the objective on governance, is, as you can see on the screen, strengthen Jamaica's active participation in regional and international climate activities. Now, Jamaica is known as a leader internationally in climate change, as well as regionally. And we want to ensure that this, this continued traction um, on our continued work in the international arena. So we have actions such as ensuring Jamaica's participation in regional and international climate change processes, particularly the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change and Paris Agreement related activities. Another action would be conducting national public and stakeholder consultations to inform Jamaica's positions which are arti articulated at these international and regional climate change negotiations. So this really speaks to ensuring that it's not just government officials that determine what positions are taken to these meetings, but also to hear from you, the public, so it can, it can inform our position going forward. Another important action would be utilizing and developing as appropriate tools and mechanisms to ensure that relevant decisions taken at regional and international levels are mainstreamed into national climate, national actions. And finally, an action would be promoting effective synergies between the national climate change agenda and those of the economic, social, and environmental sectors. The second and third strategy related to the objective on governance is 
improve the legal framework for coordinating climate change action, a very important one. And this is one of the big recommendations in this revised policy framework. And what the, an action speaks to enacting legislation to, among other things, institutionalize the roles and the functions of the responsible authorities for coordinating, coordinating action on climate change, which would include the Climate Change Division of the Ministry and the Climate Change Advisory Board, and to incorporate public participation in relation to climate action. Another strategy related to governance would be to strengthen multi-stakeholder coordination, networking, information exchange, and expertise in climate action across ministries, departments, and agencies, the private sector, and civil society. And I should pause to say here that what you're seeing on the screen is just a handful of the actions. We encourage you to please, in your time, take a look at the, the document because there are many, many actions outlined in the, in the document. So we have just pulling out some, some key actions here. One is to strengthen the climate change focal point network, and we'll speak a little bit about that later in the presentation. Another action would be to develop mechanisms and tools for the inclusion of climate change considerations into plans and programs to inform decision-making at the level of the cabinet, parliament, and local government. Now, in terms of the strategies that give effect to the objective on adaptation, there are two of them with eight and four actions respectively, and if you're following along with us, we're on page 47. So, a strategy that gives effect to the, the objective on adaptation would be develop a framework for mainstreaming climate change into ecosystem protection, spatial planning, and budget processes. So I'll just pick out a few of the actions here. One would be to ensure screening for climate change impacts is incorporated into the decision-making processes. Another one would be to utilize natural resource valuation tools and methodologies. Another one would be to finalize and implement plans and policies related to land use, such as the National Spatial Plan, mm -hmm. National Land Policy, Agricultural Land Use Policy, and others. Also, we intend to develop and implement a national environment policy for Jamaica. And also, a very important action would be to periodically update development orders, local sustainable development plans, the National Building Code, setback limits, standards and guidelines for development and enforce no-build zones to assist in addressing, addressing adaptation challenges. The second strategy that speaks to the objective on adaptation is to build capacities at the national and local levels to coordinate and enhance mainstreaming and implementation of climate action. Again, I'll just pick out a few of the actions here. One would be to prepare a national adaptation plan, and the ministry has big, big, begun work to this end. Um, another one would be to prepare and implement capacity building plans and strategies that address the adaptation needs of various sectors. And another one would be to promote and facilitate capacity building for communities to support vulnerability assessment and local adaptation plans. Moving on to the strategies that give effect to the objective on mitigation. There is one strategy related to this and five actions, and we're on page 48. The strategy is provide an enabling environment for low carbon development. And a few of these actions related to this strategy would include assessing the most appropriate mitigation actions, taking into account mitigation potential, cost, sector buying, co-benefits, and alignment with sectoral and national development priorities. Another action related to this strategy is also facilitating methods for the sharing and utilization of greenhouse gas emission data among ministries, departments, and agencies, the private sector, and academia in priority sectors. Another important action would be to establish and maintain a national measuring, reporting, and verification system for the effective implementation of the country's nationally determined contributions and other transparency-related activities. And finally, develop and disseminate tools and methodologies for the implementation of capacity building activities at all levels to support the reduction of greenhouse gas emissions. Moving on to the strategies that give effect to the objective on climate finance. There is one strategy 
and seven actions. And that one strategy is to develop a national climate change financing strategy to promote low carbon development and climate resilience. And a few of the actions related to this strategy would include undertaking on an ongoing basis assessments of climate financing requirements of key sectors, a very important one. Another one would be to build the capacity of the public and private sectors, community-based organizations, and non-governmental organizations to access climate change financing for adaptation and mitigation activities through training and technical support. Another action would be to develop monitoring tools for tracking climate financing across sectors. Another action would include creating financial incentives and disincentives related to the reduction of greenhouse gas emissions in public and private sectors. Moving on to the strategies that give effect to the objective on awareness, there are two such strategies. The first one is to develop and implement a national communication public education and behavioral change strategy at all levels. And I'll go through some of those actions. One is to establish and regularly update databases with climate change relevant data and information including the sharing of best practices, expertise and experiences, very important. Another action would be to engage and sensitize the media and institutions of learning on climate change issues on an ongoing basis. The second strategy that gives effect to the objective on public awareness is to improve the collection and dissemination of information on climate change impacts, adaptation and mitigation related opportunities at all levels so that decision makers and the general public will be better informed. I'll just read one of these actions for you and that would be to establish a mechanism to collect, record and regularly update emissions data for Jamaica's greenhouse gas emissions inventory. Moving on to the strategies which address the objective on research. And there are a few. I'll just read one for you. Uh, there, one strategy is the building capacities at the national and local levels to coordinate and enhance mainstreaming of climate action. And the related action would be to improve the, the assessment tools for observing and researching the impacts of climate change at the sectoral and community levels. And finally, the strategies which speak to the objective on technology transfer. And there are four such actions, strategies rather, I'll read uh, one for you. The, to encourage the use of environmentally sound technologies across sectors and groups, including the private sector, to contribute to climate change adaptation and mitigation initiatives. And, and one action related to this strategy is to promote is to promote and facilitate technology development, transfer and deployment, including via South-South cooperation. Just speaking very briefly to institutional arrangements, um, you will not see this graphic in the updated climate change policy framework. Um, but this is just to give you an idea of how we intend to, 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 um, to, to effect climate action at the national level. Of course, we have the cabinet and the ministry with the responsibility for climate, the climate change agenda would, would provide information to the cabinet and receive directives. And that ministry would be supported by the Climate Change Advisory Board, as well as the relevant thematic working groups of Vision 2030. I mentioned before a climate change policy, fo a climate change focal point network for Jamaica. Now, this is a very active network. It's well trained um, and it, it includes ministries, departments, agencies, civil society, private sector representatives, and academia. The one difference we have here is to include, um, uh, include on the climate change focal point network um, parish and community level representatives. And this is my last slide. I'll just pause very briefly to reflect on how we intend to implement this climate change policy. There is a five-year implementation plan that was developed to take into consideration a broad number of stakeholders. And this, this action plan, this implementation plan is very important. We want you to take your time and please look through the implementation plan and let us know if there are gaps 
um, if there are other stakeholders that we need to consider, if there are other plan actions that we need to consider. The Ministry with the Responsibility for Environment and Climate Change will oversee and support the implementation of this policy framework. And we intend to present to Cabinet an annual report on the measures to implement the policy framework. This policy framework will be reviewed every five years. And the Ministry with Responsibility for Climate Change will conduct a public review to determine its effectiveness. I will now hand over to our moderator. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Origio. That was a lot of information, and I'm hoping we'll have quite a bit of questions. And do remember, you can send your questions through the um, GIS platform, which is at GIS News or on the GIS YouTube channel. You can also do so by going to Twitter and Facebook at M, as in mango, E-G-J-C underscore J-M. All right? Really want to hear from you. I have a few questions uh, uh, here. And um, please get your questions in because we won't. We have limited time, but we have enough time to take your questions. And then I have one or two of my own as well. This one on Zoom. How will the policy framework address ish the issue of no longer providing investment protection for investments with deleterious effects on biodiversity and climate? And how will the policy enable improved participation of marginalized and underinvested communities in addressing climate change? So let me just repeat the first one so somebody can take the first one. How will the policy framework address the issue of no longer providing investment protection for investments with deleterious effects on biodiversity and climate? Question number one. The, this, this policy framework advocates broadly as a principle the, the protection of our, our biodiversity and environmental resources. So um, there are various actions that speak to, for ex example, natural resources valuation tools and methodologies to ensure that we're protecting our resources. So the policy d does speak in terms of in detail to so some actions as well as broadly in principle. And uh, the second part, how will the policy enable improved participation of marginalized and underinvested communities in addressing climate change? There are a number of actions and a strategy that relates to, to improving uh, public awareness and engagement with the, the public. Um, there is a, a principle that speaks to equity and non-discrimination and that we put that in really to focus on vulnerable communities. So it is a principle that un underpins the entire policy framework. Um, one of the things that we um, have advocated for in this policy framework are actions that relate to making sure that there are regularly published materials that are easily accessible and user friendly. And these, these publications would target some of the vulnerable communities, underserved areas and so on. You know, I'm looking at Antoinette Aiken over there interpreting for the deaf and the hard of hearing and I'm wondering what kind of, I hear you talk about the communication and you can't talk about the communication and the awareness, public, um, uh, public education awareness. For the deaf community, have you thought about how you'd approach that and use phone nothing? Yes, indeed. Many people don't know that because it's a texting that they use and the WhatsApp. But I find that sometimes uh, for general um, information, we forget the deaf community and other um, communities within persons with disabilities. But um, Antoinette, I'm certain, will help you out with that. All right, on Facebook, how far along is Jamaica in preparations? Your father, my, the phone just went a little blank, had it open for too long. <laughs> how far along is Jamaica in preparations for earning carbon credits on the carbon market? Wow, that sounds like you, Mr. Lean. Uh, that's a good question. Um, so what I can say is that under the, the CAPE program, which I spoke to in the presentation, we, did, we actually did a, a study on carbon pricing. 
Um, so we are not in the stage of actually um, selling our carbon as yet on the carbon market or even taxing carbon, um, but we are doing studies on it. Uh, uh, the best way Jamaica can approach the carbon market. There are some people who have no clue what you're talking about. So tell us where does carbon come from that we think about selling carbon? So we emit gases, emit greenhouse gases. Um, so we have a inventory of greenhouse gases. So Jamaica has a, a, a specific um, metric to measure how much greenhouse gases that we emit as a country or as sectors, or as an industry, and so forth. And when we decide to reduce greenhouse gases by using renewables in our energy mix or so forth, we have a, a, a reduction in the amount of greenhouse gases that we emit. And so that, um, that space between how much we, we, we said that we emitted and how much we reduce, we can, sell, we can actually sell those um, emissions on the, the carbon market to other countries that are emitting more than, um, than they reported. Okay, so yes. what would they use it for? They would use it to continue emitting. So it's, it's, you see, it's, it's a, a new balance. area. I'm just pushing yeah. because it's a new area so, and people need to know. Like, yes. You're speaking about the greenhouse gases. I noticed you didn't mention any ozone layer or anything like that. Um, we don't talk about that anymore? Uh, that's a different area. No, but I'm just talking. The, the greenhouse gases don't affect that. <laughs> want to <laughs> check that. <laughs> the, the greenhouse um, house gases affect that ozone layer? Yes. So, um, ozone is also one of the greenhouse gases. But we have a specific um, international agreement that deals with the depletion of the ozone layer, which is the Montreal Protocol. And uh, Ms. Origio in her presentation had mentioned it. So many of these international agreements that deal with atmospheric related matters are all linked together. So um, when we talk about um, depletion of the ozone layer, we talk about issues under the Montreal Protocol. And when we're speaking specifically about climate change related matters, we speak about the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change and its Paris Agreement. All right. All right, but those things come up for discussion, eh? Yes, But yes. I'm, just, I'm just really just noticing that we, we are focused, not just here, that I didn't hear so much focus on that anymore, and I wondered, because we, you perhaps get it in a broader sense now. No, the, we have um, programs, in fact, um, NEPA has an ozone unit, and they have a country program that deals with, that responds to the matters related to the Montreal Protocol. And so we have been reducing our ozone um, depletion um, chemicals, um, looking at um, HFCs, for instance, hydrofluorocarbons, refrigerants, and other ozone depleting substances and putting measures in place to reduce um, importation and reduce emissions. So then the new refrigerators are far more efficient than yes. the older ones yes. where that's concerned. All right, thank you so much. And let's go. Here's another. Where food security is concerned as part of adaptation for climate change, in what way was the Ministry of Agriculture and agricultural stakeholders involved in the climate change policy framework? That looks like you, Mr. Riggio. Yes. yes. That's from Facebook. We thank you for your questions. Thank you for that question. That's a very interesting question. Um, I, we have been undertaking a series of consultations on this updated climate change policy framework. In fact, the very first consultation session was with the the public sector. And so we invited the Ministry of Agriculture, we had their comments, and they were also involved in the development of the first, the 2015 climate change policy. So they've been, they've been involved in an integral fashion. And we also will, in, as we refine the document and finalize it, have an opportunity to, to, to confer with them again. All right. And could we just elaborate a little bit more on the, you spoke so often about the public education and the awareness program, and the, I think you spoke about a national communication, right? What was that? Strategy. Strategy. Let's talk a little bit about it because, and you mentioned media. Media mm -hmm. will help to drive the knowledge out there, but if, they are, if, if we don't reach them, to make them recognize that this is something important. And if they don't recognize that it is important, then we, we'll be having a battle uphill. Yes, certainly. Um, one of the, the actions that we have put very deliberately in the policy framework is to engage the media specifically. Um, 
the climate change, at, if there is a climate change communication strategy, um, I think that my colleague, Mr. Elaine, might be able to speak to it in some detail. But certainly in the policy framework, we speak to a number of elements. We spoke to engaging the media, making sure that information is digestible to everyone, making sure that we, are, we have an open avenue to hear concerns, making sure that there's regular ongoing communication with the private sector, public sector agencies, NGOs, and so on. Perhaps you should have a media rep on uh, in one of your committees. I'm making that recommendation very important. Somebody from the Press Association of Jamaica. Mm. All right. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, go ahead, um, Ms. Guthrie. We are very open to how it is that we can communicate better with the populace. Uh, we don't want anyone to be left behind. So in crafting these national policies, it is the, the primary... Um, uh, the priority for us is to be sure that the average Jamaican understands and appreciates what it is that we are trying to communicate. We also want to listen and hear their concerns and be able to reflect that in policy prescriptions that the government and others will implement going forward. So the idea that through the media and other, um, other bodies to be able to have effective timely and accurate communication to the populace on key environmental issues. In, in, include somebody. Include yes, somebody yes, from media or be. maybe we two people. We are very open to that. Yes. Uh, you mentioned the five C's. The, it's a big, long name. Caribbean uh, Community Climate Change Center. What kind of work do they do there and how do we participate in the five C's? So the five C's um, is a is an organization, uh, a regional organization. Where is it headquartered? Belize. Belize, yes. okay. So it's a regional or organization that um, really advocates for the uh, reduction of greenhouse gases and building resilience in the Caribbean. So what they do is that they, um, they actually implement projects that, that do these activities. Yes. And how do we, we participate in 5C's projects all the time? Um, the, the government, the government of yes. Jamaica. Yes. So we are involved? Yes, we are involved. Internationally, how involved are we with climate change? Outside of the Paris Agreement and the Montreal Agreement, uh, w what is happening outside of all of that that you might be involved with? That, I mean, you told us a lot today that we don't know. So we are very involved internationally. Um, uh, uh, the Conference of the Parties, which is an international climate change conference that takes, place, yes, that takes place every year, every year. We're there every year. Even the Prime Minister attends, the Minister attends. And um, we also have, have projects with, with international countries, such as uh, the UK and so forth. So we, we are very involved internationally. So you're satisfied with... Okay. Just say too yes. that um, it would be Mr. Elaine can speak to that. Um, we are co-chairs of the NDC partnership, and that's a ministerial um, um, post. And so we work. We are co-chairing that partnership now with um, the UK, and the UK, as you know, was a COP, is a COP26 president. So this NDC partnership allows um, support to um, developing country parties such as Jamaica to help to strengthen their climate resilience. Um, and so it's an important role that Jamaica has played in guiding this type of partnership with, with the UK and we are very proud to have been um, a part of, of that, um, that initiative. Right, thank you. I think we've pretty much covered the questions that we've had. I want to thank you ladies and gentlemen and of course, we had the Permanent Secretary Sewell and the Minister Matthew Samuda early on, but they had to leave for other engagements. We want to thank them too. But before I go there, it's been a very informative uh, two or so hours. And I'm hoping that many young people, not so young, more mature people, and everyone will get involved and get to be better informed about what this thing really means, both the emissions 
policy framework and the climate change policy. So we are at the end of this discussion on the emissions policy framework for Jamaica and the update to the climate change policy. But before we go, however, I'd like to thank a number of persons who have made this forum possible. First, I'd like to thank you. Yes, you for your participation, for your questions, for your comments. Remember that it was stated from the very outset that they may have gaps and they would like for you to say where they are. They, you, there may be opportunities that you see and they want you to share what those are. Thank you for your questions and your feedback and these will go to the policy and the finalization of that, those two policies. Special thanks to Senator the Honorable Matthew Samuda, Minister Without Portfolio, and Permanent Secretary Mrs. Audrey Sewell, both of the Ministry of Economic Growth and Job Creation, who, which houses the environment and climate change portfolios, and which, of course, has drafted the two policies discussed this evening. Thanks also to our presenters. We've got lots of information. Ms. Gillian Guthrie, Acting Chief Technical Director in the Policy Planning and Evaluation Division of the Ministry. Ms. Nicole Origio, Acting Senior Director in the Environment and Risk Management Branch of the Ministry. Mr. Ajani Aline, Research and Development Officer of the Climate Change Division of the Ministry. And Ms. Shannon Sukra, Manager of the Air Quality Management Branch of the National Environment and Planning Agency. Agency. And just remember, when you look at dust, I say dust, dust have different sizes. Remember that, okay? That just stuck with me. <laughs> Their presentations have given us all a better understanding of what the two policies are intended to achieve for Jamaica and for us Jamaicans. Of course, this production would not be possible without the technical support from the Jamaica Information Service, and so we thank them for their expertise in the smooth and successful execution of this consultation. Thanks also to the Public Broadcasting Corporation of Jamaica for allowing us to use their studio for this consultation. And I just want to do a quick little dig here. For those persons who do not know where the Public Broadcasting Corporation of Jamaica is located, if if you're at a certain stage and age in life, you will remember the Jamaica Broadcasting Corporation right there. So name change, but the place still there. Of course, I'm taking a dig at my friends. Of course, my friends meaning they thought I didn't know where I was going. Just joking. Of course, we cannot forget the planning team from the Ministry of Economic Growth and Job Creation. We thank them for their hard work on this consultation, as well as the team from the National Environment and Planning Agency. We thank you. And for those resource persons who are online, but everything went smoothly here so we didn't have to call on you. Before we go, let me just remind everyone that the green papers on the emissions policy framework and the update to the climate change policy framework may be accessed on the website of the Ministry of Economic Growth and Job Creation, and that is megjc.gov.jm forward slash policies. And copies of the Green Paper will also be made available at the municipal corporations and the public libraries. Written comments should be sent to policycomments at megjc.gov. But you have a deadline, March 31 this year, 2022. And today is the 22nd of the second month of the year 2022, the twos. So that's it from us here. And in closing, I ask that we all commit to accepting the challenge of reducing emissions and tackling the adverse effects of climate change. Together, we can achieve. So let us all work together to make the outcomes of this consultation meaningful. Thank you and walk good. <laughs>